Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about Texas and some of their issues in some one-score games and especially allowing teams back into those games. So, excuse me, it's definitely something that could come back to bite them this upcoming year and something to watch as they walk into the SEC. But let's get into fall camp intel. Let's break down some of the different headlines from around the country. And there were a number of quarterbacks that were named their starter. But let's start in Florida State and let's break down this team that is kicking off in about four hours and a couple or four hours in four days and a couple hours uh, over in Ireland they're probably getting on a plane right about now but as of right now throughout fall camp DJ was DJ he was roughly what you've seen the last couple of years someone that has a really high ceiling but then some days it just looks really out of sync it looks very confusing is missing uh, spots and that could be a problem this upcoming year because he's going to have to be more consistent this year if they want to do what they are capable of doing but at the end of the day you do have some weapons to throw to in that offense uh, Malik Benson is leading the way for the wide receivers but Kyle Morlock is the guy to watch at tight end he's made a ton of waves this uh, last couple of weeks and is definitely someone that frankly could be one of their leading reception guys this year because DJ loves his tight ends that is for sure Jalen Brown's also another guy to watch um, a very talented young player at wide receiver that is going to make plays this upcoming year Cam Davis made some waves at running back and frankly all the running backs made waves along with that O-line so that is likely going to be the identity of this team a lot of running the ball and then let DJ pick his moments here and there on the defensive side of the ball they are dominant they're going to be really really good one of the best defenses in the country Patrick Payton is an outright problem Shaheem Brown frankly I think could be an all-american at the end of the year and Azariah Thomas took another step forward and he was a darn good player last year so it's definitely an, a defense that is replacing a lot of guys but it seems like they are right where they want to be and everything seems ready to roll you know DJ is Definitely still a worry as you get into this season, but overall, this team looks ready to roll, and they're going to have to be in about four days when they face off against Georgia Tech. But moving on to their rival, Florida, Jacoby Jackson continues to make waves throughout fall camp, and with Montreal Johnson down, it kind of gave him a little bit more of ability to step into a bigger part of this offense, and Montreal Johnson still very much has to be healthy, no doubt about that, and frankly, I think he will be for week one, but if he's not, you know you got a good option right here, and you got Trey on Webb right behind him. So you got to feel pretty good if you're Florida now. Montreal Johnson's got to be on the field against Miami, and I think he will. But it definitely gives you a little bit of peace of mind, hypothetically, if he was not. And overall, this Florida team has been operating with the confidence that a team that their coach could be fired at the end of the year just shouldn't be, plain and simple. There are a couple of teams that over the last couple of years has walked in with a coach that you're very much questioning about. It's not very often that they walk in with this much confidence, with this much ability, and with the talent on the roster that they have. So I'm not saying Florida is going to you know jump out and you know make the playoff or anything crazy, but everyone's pointing at that schedule saying they're going to go four and eight, five and seven, and he's going to be fired by October. I wouldn't be so sure of that, but we'll find out in week one, and we're going to talk about the team that they're going to be facing off against right here. Miami is a very interesting team, and the guy that's been making the most waves throughout fall camp is Elijah Arroyo. Excuse me. He made some uh, waves last year, but got injured early on in the year, and he's right back to doing that this, up uh, this fall camp. So he's going to be a huge piece of their offense. The tight ends in general, I think, are really, really strong. They got two Elijahs, actually. Elijah Arroyo and Elijah Lofton, a very talented freshman that I think both are going to be problems for any defense that they face and definitely gives Cam Ward a really you know safe good option at that tight end position. Chris Johnson Jr. is the guy I want to talk to you about and yes that Chris Johnson and yes he can run like his father. He has absolutely world-class speed. I believe he runs a 10-200 so absolutely ridiculous and he's someone that is definitely going to make plays for them this fall whether it's in the return game or as a change of pace back this guy is going to get on the field and he's going to be hard to stop when he gets his uh, feet rolling so definitely someone to watch this upcoming year and someone that could really burst on the scene in a lot of different ways on the back end of that defense, they've had a couple of really big players show out. Michelle Powell came in from Washington. Sounds like he's leading the way both on the field and off the field as a leader. Has kind of taken that role very seriously, and it's something that they need him to do. Other guy is Markeith Williams. He's making every single play in fall camp, and it's something that they very much need. With Cameron Kitchens and James Williams walking out the door, you need some safeties to step up, and it sounds like Markeith Williams is going to be that guy. 
Over to Penn State, we said we would talk about these wide receivers a little bit later. Well, it sounds like Trey Wallace and Liam Clifford are leading the way at those wide receiver positions, the one and two. In saying that uh, Julian Fleming was going to come in as the wide receiver one and didn't, a actually, there are some people over at Penn State that have said Harrison Wallace was going to be the one regardless, but Julian Fleming was going to start. I can almost promise you that, and he is not anymore. So definitely going to be an interesting thing. He is kind of becoming a leader, which is could be a very helpful thing for this team as he's played a lot more football than a number of guys in that room. So definitely will be something to watch. And if Julian Fleming can come off the bench and make some plays, then maybe this wide receiver position is a little bit better off than I thought. But it sounds like the defense and the offense are kind of playing to a stalemate, which is actually pretty good news because I do think this defense is going to be really good. And you do have some questions about the offense. So if they're trading punches right now, you got to feel pretty good if you're a Penn State fan. And it sounds like the cornerback group is going to be maybe even better than last year, even with all of the people leaving. It sounds like A.J. Harris is playing really well. Cam Miller, the guy in your uh, uh the guy on your screen right there, number five, is a very talented kid, definitely going to make some plays. Davion uh, Collins and Jalen Kimber are both guys that are going to get plenty of run at that position, so they lost some big-time dudes. You know, they lost Kalen King, they lost Johnny Dixon, they lost Daquan Hardy, but they still have some dudes in that uh, room and definitely is going to be a really solid unit. The O-line is the big-time question here. You know, they have some really good players. Drew Shelton is taking over for Olu Fashanu, which is a big-time question mark at that left tackle position. But overall, it looks like they're still kind of rotating things. They're still trying to figure out what the right five is. And I tend to think that they're going to figure out, and they have a little bit of runway to figure it out. But frankly, that uh, West Virginia game could be a bigger problem than they want it to be if that O-line is not, you know, at least sort of figured out before that Week 1 matchup. Moving on to Michigan, the biggest thing here is it sounds like this defense is going to be quote-unquote positionless. It sounds like they are just going to have all the dynamic athletes, the best 11 on the field at any given moment, and they have a lot of really good 11. <laughs> there is no doubt about that. They are going to be as dangerous of a team as there is in the country, and with Wing Martindale at the controls, I fully understand why positionless football is the way they want to go about business. Alex Orgy just continues to take uh, this team by storm continues to take the reins as the quarterback one and he's going to be the guy um it sounds like he's making more and more consistent passes and if that comes along quickly then things get really interesting I'm kind of viewing him kind of as a almost Jalen Milrow type player a very different style but in the terms of I think it's going to take him a couple of weeks to really get rolling but this is a very talented kid and if they can call the offense in you know in accordance to what he wants to do, he's going to be able to make plenty of plays. I can promise you that. So maybe it's like uh, Jalen Milrow exactly, and it's a really ugly game against Texas. He gets benched and then makes his way back on the field. But at the end of the day, I do think he's making some big-time strides and absolutely will be a, a huge player for them this upcoming year at quarterback. And then moving on to wide receiver, they need young guys to step up. It sounds like Channing Goodwin is one of the guys to watch there. He's a very talented freshman wide receiver, and they got two of them. Amarian Stewart is another guy to watch there, but overall, I think both those guys are likely going to get on the field because they probably got to get on the field. If they are that talented and if they can really go with the ball in their hands, then you're going to have to make sure that they're on the field, and Alex Orgy has a number of other targets to go to, and definitely something to watch in that front, but... Moving on to Oklahoma, I definitely had some questions about this defensive line as we got into the year. It sounds like they feel pretty good about it. It sounds like the front line with Dominic Williams and Dejon Terry is doing exactly what you want them to do. It sounds like Jaden Jackson and uh, David Stone, the freshman coming in, are going to play a piece in this D-line. Uh, so it's not going to be the most elite group in the, in the country, but it seems to be coming along the way that they want to. And with the linebackers that they have behind them, they can make a couple of mistakes at that interior defensive line and still be more than fine on the back end. But the other news out of this one is Andre Anthony. He got injured actually in the Texas game of last year and is still struggling with that injury. And frankly, Oklahoma has plenty of weapons to where this won't make too big of a difference, but this is a guy you want on the field. This is a guy that you can just get the ball to and he can make something happen with his legs, where whether it's a screen or a drag, what, what have you. This is a guy that's really special with the ball in his hands and you're going to need that guy on the field. It's definitely going to be one of those things to watch throughout the year where I think they have plenty of guys with Nick Anderson, with uh, Deion Burks, and a number of others, but you're going to want as many options as you can going into the SEC, and this is one that definitely would be very valuable to this team if he was on the field. 
And then finally, the big thing out of Oklahoma camp is Zach Alley, the new defensive coordinator, is remarkable. And frankly, if you were following him at Jacksonville State, you probably knew that. But this is a guy that can really coach football, and he is very young at this very moment. So I would be surprised if he wasn't calling plays somewhere this time next year, frankly, because this guy is really remarkable. And this Oklahoma defense seems to be exactly where you want it to be and is likely going to be the way that they win games in a lot of different ways, you know. The turnover troubles for Jackson Arnold still seem to be very real, and if that's the case, then this defense is going to be asked to do a lot. It sounds like they have plenty of ability to answer that call, but definitely the way that they're going to win games is that 21-17 or that 24-20 type game that could be a little bit ugly, but maybe they get the job done at the end of the day. One of the games that they're looking forward to the most over at Oklahoma is that Auburn game. Definitely a huge one, and the wide receiver room there is going to be really good. Um, Whether it's Cam Coleman or Perry Thompson as freshmen that are going to make big plays, or Keandre Lambert-Smith is likely going to be the wide receiver one there. Sam Jackson the fifth is making big-time plays. Malcolm Simmons is making plays. You also have Robert Lewis, Caleb, uh, Caleb Burton. It's ridiculous the amount of guys that they have at that position, especially when you think back to two years ago when... It was a big time question mark for this team and it doesn't stop there. You know, Peyton Thorne, it sounds like he is really making strides and doing things that you want him to do. And frankly, when you surround him with all those guys, that definitely does help that. So if he can take that step forward, if he can play a little bit closer to 2021 Peyton Thorne than 2023, then I think he's a very dangerous player. And this is a team that they're not going to win the SEC or anything, but they could easily win some games that you do not expect them to and ruin the fun for someone else. Uh, The other guy that's making noise is Rivaldo Fairweather. This is a guy that transferred over last year and made some plays here and there. Wasn't necessarily the huge part of the offense that I expect him to be this year, but definitely was a big-time player, and he is a guy that's just a straight-up mismatch. Wherever you want to put him on a linebacker, on a safety, on a corner, he's going to be a problem, no no doubt about it. And he's definitely someone that is going to have a huge, huge part in this offense with all all the wide receivers on the outside. Maybe it's just Rivaldo Fairweather over the middle of the field just on a seam route that you know ruins a game for someone so definitely a player to watch and it sounds like the offense at least has all of the uh, weapons that they definitely want on that team and then the back end is still a little bit of a question they brought in a ton of different transfers like Jaron Thompson the uh, safety from Texas and the talent level is high there's no doubt about that but They still got to put it together, and it's the same worry I have about Oregon. It's the same worry I have about Ole Miss. It's the same worry I have about pretty much every team that transferred in a lot of guys at one particular position, especially the back end. Fitting them all together is not an easy thing to do, and it's definitely something that could hold back Auburn a little bit this year. Maybe they're playing a lot of shootouts, which would be a really weird thing to watch, but definitely something that is going to be huge for this team. And I think more than anyone, Jaron Thompson is going to be the guy that is going to have to step up and make some big plays on that back end if they don't want to be exposed pretty much every single week. Moving on to the quarterbacks that have been named as their starter, Malik Murphy, the Texas transfer, has been named the starter for the Duke Blue Devils. This is a huge thing for him. This is a guy that can stretch the field. There's no two ways about that. There are a million things that he can do, but more than anything else, he can sling the rock. He can uh, throw about 60 or 70 yards down the field, and I think that's likely the the pattern that you're going to see from Duke is kind of the pattern you saw from Alabama a year ago, where it's run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and then we're going to go over top and try to beat you on one play. And I think that's something that they could have success in. You know, it might not be the prettiest offense in the world or the most consistent, but they're going to be able to beat you on one play and totally change a game. So definitely something to watch. And obviously tough for Grayson Loftus, but it got to feel good if you're Duke, knowing that you have someone right there that has won some big games for you and is a solid player in your offense. So definitely something to watch, but Malik Murphy is going to be the starter. And frankly, I think he's going to have a pretty solid year this upcoming year. Over to USC, Miller Moss has been named the starter, and frankly, I don't know if it had to be named. He was battling Jaden Maiava technically, but overall, for a long time, everyone's felt like this is the guy pretty much since the Holiday Bowl a year ago. uh, People felt like this was going to be the guy, and it makes for a really cool story in Week 1. It's Miller Moss against Garrett Nussmeyer, two guys that waited their turn, two guys that watched you know, Heisman-level players uh, play at their school and said, I'll just wait. Uh, I'll wait for my second, and then when I come, it's going to be incredible. And we'll see what happens in that week one in Vegas, but it's going to be awesome. Two true gunslingers against two not-so-good defenses, and it's going to be a 
downright show. I can promise you that. So a couple of quarterbacks named. There are a couple more that I will update you on tomorrow. But at the end of the day, everything continues to roll out of fall camp. And we're winding down pretty soon. So they got to get some things in order. Still some big time questions around some of the biggest teams in the country. So definitely will be something to watch as we get into the next couple of days, as we get into the season especially. But that'll do it for for the fourth segment here. Let's take our last break. And when we come back, I'm going to break down the 10 things that I love the most about college football. We have college football in four days, and I feel like it's a good time to break down what makes this sport so special to me. So I'll break that down right after this. So stick with us. 